Howdy everyone and welcome back. And we've been talking about circuits for a while now and we've talked about a number of topics in it, but there's still a lot of things to add and we're gonna keep working on. So today we're gonna to work on at least two things. So we learned how to combine capacitors before into one equivalent capacitor. So now we're gonna do the same thing with resistors. How do you combine several resistors and turn into one? And then the other major topic we're gonna to talk about, really major topic for direct current circuits is Kirchhoff's laws. Okay, so let's first talk about combining resistors and circuits. So before we talked about having series and we talked about having parallel, and it turns out the rules for combining resistors are exactly opposite of that for capacitors. So if I have a bunch of resistors in series, so they're all in one line, so the current has to go through all of them, determined to one equivalent resistor, I can just simply add them across. So it's like taking a bunch of resistors and just sort of kind of combining them end to end. So if you put a bunch of resistors in parallel, we make it so that there's a bunch of paths for the electrons to travel. It turns out then we use this one inverse rule that we learn with capacitors. So it actually makes sense why the resistor adding rules are actually the opposite for the capacitor adding rules. So, so recall how we calculated capacitance before. So there's epsilon naught cross-sectional area over the length. Now how to calculate resistance was R equals some inherent resistivity length over A. And you can notice how these get flipped. So instead of it being cross-sectional area over length, it's the length over the cross-sectional area. So before to make a greater capacitance, you had to increase the cross-sectional area and that you can effectively do that by adding things in parallel. Well, for the resistors, you can increase it by increasing the length. And that's essentially what we're doing in this case. So now we're gonna to come to one of the biggest topics here. It's one of the things that's always true for direct currents called Kirchhoff's laws. And we've been using them a teeny bit, but now let's formally learn them. So the first one's called the junction rule, and you can use it whenever you have a junction where current gets goes in and gets split two ways, or comes in and gets added together. So basically what this law is saying is the sum of the currents at a junction is always zero. So if I have some amount of current going in, the same amount of current has to be coming out, maybe just split two ways now. Or the opposite, if I have two converging currents, they have to add up to this final current. So it's just a statement of the conservation of charge. So when charge comes in, it has to come out of a junction. It doesn't disappear or get created anywhere in this. And then this next rule is also just a conservation law, but instead a conservation law of energy, not charge. So it's saying if I go in any loop and any circuit, so here's one loop, but this has to work for every single loop. If I go and add up the voltages over everything, the sum of the voltages always has to equal zero. Now there's some type of signs that we'll have to figure out. We'll do a problem and, and really talk about that in detail. So what I mean by a conservation law of energy is if I start at a point, I go around in a circle, I have to come at the same energy level as if I was before. Otherwise, it would actually be advantageous for any charges to go infinitely around and gain infinite energy. And we know that doesn't happen. We don't have any particles running around with infinite energy. They come to the same energy. So this is the same statement. If I go up and down a hill, but I come back to the same place that I start, I have to be at the same energy level. That's all we're saying here, but just with electrical stuff. So both of these laws end up being really incredibly helpful with problem solving. Uh, imagine we're gonna pull out this stuff all the time uh, and do a lot of problems where this is really the only thing we can do. Okay, so let's do a resistor equivalent problem of something we've done with capacitors. Again, we're just sort of switching what we're talking about specifically. So we have a bunch of resistors, some of them are in parallel and series and kind of weird combinations of both, but the first thing we want to find is the equivalent resistance. I can take all of these four resistors and turn them into one resistor. What is the resistance of that? So we're given the resistance of each of them, uh, and then we can go back and use our rules for series and parallel and then combine them step by step. So again, we want to say things like this in series, but again, there's kind of a weirdness because it's another resistor. Again, we have to go back to the pictures. What is exactly in series? What is exactly in parallel? Well, these two things are obviously in parallel. So we should actually start there and combine these two first. And that's what we do. And so because they're in parallel, we have to use that inverse rule for resistors. And we have seven ohms, we have 10 ohms. We add those and invert it. We have 70 over 17 ohms, kind of a weird number, but that's our answer for the combination of these two. And then we get a circuit that's just three in series. You could see what that is just gonna be easy. We just add them across and that's what we do here. Go four plus this combination of two and three, add it to four. That's all that's going on here. We get an equivalent resistance of 17.1. So now we've gone and combined it down to one resistor and we're gonna have to back it up to get the rest of the quantities that we want. So we're told the voltage between points A and B, then we wanna get the current going through each resistor. 
So the first thing we're going to do is find the current going through this one equivalent resistor. If I replaced all of them, that's going to be that. So I put in this equivalent resistance and put this voltage that I just learned, use V equals IR, I get back this equivalent current. That's what's going through this one resistor. So I have this one equivalent resistor, so let's think about what happens when I go back and having these three resistors that were just all in series. What's the current going through those three? Well, it turns out it's just the same as this equivalent resistors. It's just this equivalent current. That's what's going through one and four. Okay, those ones are done. But you can see how this same current gets split two ways, so we're gonna have to do a little more work. So what we're gonna have to do is write down Kirchhoff's junction rule. So it's saying that the current that's coming in through here equals these two added together. You can see that's exactly what we've written down here. But the problem is we don't know two or three, so we have to do a little bit of work to kind of separate them out. So recall the two things in parallel have the same voltage. We can write the, these voltages out using V equals IR, and we can get a relationship between the two currents. So then we can figure out how much current is going one direction versus the other. So we go and substitute that in for I3. Then we have things in terms of just I2. We can separate out I2 out here. There's an I2 in both of these terms. We pull it out, go divide this to the other side. So then we get an expression for I2 and it's 1.17 amps. And then we go back to this equation. We know two of the things, just one unknown I3. We solve for it. We get the remaining current 0.82. So going back, we found the total current going through this equivalent resistor argued that it's the same current going through the three equivalent resistors. That gives us it's the current of these two. And they could find the current going through each of these using Kirchhoff's junction rule. And think about a little bit more of a practical problem, something to think about regards to our home. So why does plugging in two dimini devices into a power strip trip the circuit breaker? So you have power strips. I have a number of them running around. You can put a ton of devices in them, but you can't plug an indefinite amount. So what is going on? Why can't you do that? So essentially you can think about all the devices you're putting in as little resistors. Now they may be computers, but they're essentially taking energy, using it for other things. It's gonna end up usually as heat. So a resistor is a pretty good model and you're putting it in parallel. So all these things are rated to have 120 volts. That's what's coming out of the wall. So if you want everything to have the same voltage, you put it in parallel. And so if you wanted to find the equivalent resistance of these resistors, you have to do that one over R rule. And you'll find, uh, you take an N number of devices with the same amount of resistances, you get R equals N, where again, N is the number of devices. And so the more devices you add, the lower this equivalent resistance will be. So you have this parallel circuit in the end, and this is gonna be a pretty small resistance after everything is said and done. And so you have current going through this really small resistor. It's gonna keep increasing. It's gonna be a really large current eventually. And so it also turns out that wires all have these little bit of resistance in them. So you decrease the resistance, you increase the current. And so that when you have current going through these wires that have very little resistance, some bad stuff starts happening. So recall that the power going through a resistor is I squared over R. So if this thing, even though it has a really little resistance, it's not usually you know, losing that much power in the wires, but once you get a large current, you can start really heating up all the extra wires in your home. So this is why you have a circuit breaker. So it gets to the point where if this current becomes too much to start damaging the wires in your home, it trips and then you have to go turn it on in your basement or whatever it is. It can it just prevent you from destroying the inherent things in your home. So it could be annoying, but it's probably better than, you know, paying a few hundred or a thousand bucks for an electrician to fix all the wiring in your home. So a related question to this is, is imagine you have 75 watt light bulbs and they're all connected in parallel. How many do you need to actually trip a circuit breaker? So 30 amps is huge, but that's usually the limit to where actually everything gets turned off. So we can go back and actually work out what the resistance of these light bulbs are. So we use P equals IV and then use the version with V squared over R. We can solve for this R here. We know the voltage is, you know, because it's connected to the wall. It turns out 120 volts through all the outlets in your house. We know the power. And so we can find that resistance of one of these light bulbs is like about 200 ohms. So we can find this equivalent resistance that this big parallel circuit has to be to trip the circuit breaker. So we know the maximum current it'll handle. We know the voltage in the wall. We can go and use V equals IR. And if this thing goes below four ohms, then you know we're gonna have a problem. Okay, then we go back and then we learned from the last page that if you have a bunch of things in parallel, they're all the same resistance. You can eventually solve it be R over N. 
So it turns out the number has to be 48 light bulbs in your house. So that doesn't seem like a lot. It seems like you have other things going on, but most of the things in your house aren't really turning on all the time. The refrigerator is not turning on all the time. You know, my computer's off right now. So you really don't have that much power going from the wall, but these are also older light bulbs. Um, these are incandescent ones. Modern ones or LED ones are closer to something like 12 or 20 watts at max. So you could really plug in a ton of those even in comparison. Okay, we have a scary looking problem here and we can see, I mean, this doesn't look so bad. What are you talking about? Well, the thing that's gonna be confusing us and causing us a lot of grief is the fact that we have two batteries in here. And so we have a bunch of resistors and maybe our first thought is, oh, we can find the equivalent resistance. But again, there's some weirdness in here. There's a battery next to resistor and there's another battery next to resistor. We can't really use the breaking down rules. Now, sure, if there was another resistor right next to this one, you can see, Oh, that's just in series, sure. So when we have all this complication here, we actually have to use other methods, and those other methods, in this case, happen to be Kirchhoff's laws. So can we reduce down to a single resistor? No, we can't. There's too many complicated things. We can't reduce it down to the simple pictures that we have. So we still wanna find the currents everywhere, so we have to use Kirchhoff's laws, potentially both of them, but we'll see. We'll start with the loop laws here. So how these problems work is that you really can draw three loops here. So you see you have two, and actually you can draw this overall loop. It actually doesn't matter, but it turns out you really can only write two down. The other one is actually linearly dependent on the other one, so you only have two of them you can use. You can pick whatever ones you want. You can also need to guess the direction of the currents. So you, you can take a pic look at the picture and you can sort of guess what direction it's gonna be, but if you guess wrong, that's okay. It means when you get the answer in the end, you'll just get a negative sign and you go, okay, it's actually going this way. You know, I was wrong. That's fine. But all you need to do, the main thing I want to emphasize with this kind of problem is you need to be consistent as you're going through methodically writing down the voltages and currents of everything. You just need to choose something and then go with it. So let's go over how to write down the voltages from everything in the loop. There's a few rules to keep in mind. So again, I choose a bunch of currents. I choose that the currents are this way. If I'm wrong, negative sign, that's fine. But I chose, I wanna use these loops. So I know Kirchhoff's laws are telling me that if I go in a loop, the voltages, is, if I add them all together, have to go to zero. I know that has to be true in any circuit, even these really scary, complicated circuits. And so let's go look at loop one and we'll add up all the voltages and go. So here we go. Okay, so we start here, we go this direction, we're going in the same direction that the battery's pointing, so this battery's gonna act like normal, and normally batteries add voltage, so I have a positive 20 volts here. So we keep going, we go through this resistor, so we're going in the same direction as I chose this I1 current. So again, notice, if you haven't noticed, every time I come to a junction, I know that the current's gonna change, which is why I chose an I1, I2, and I3 every time. You know, you see that these junctions are separating them, but everything here should have it the same current, but greater point. So, so I'm going in the same direction as the current, which means the resistor is gonna act like normal. What do resistors normally do? Well, they take away voltage. And so we can write down a voltage of this resistor as V equals IR. So I have the R here, but I don't know what the I is. It's actually gonna be an unknown we'll solve for later. Okay, I keep going. I have to finish the loop and then I go through this resistor. So this resistor, I chose, and I guess that the current's gonna be going this direction, be going to the right. So now I'm going the opposite direction as the current, which means the signs are gonna get flipped. So the resistors usually take away voltage. Well, this one is gonna be adding voltage. I get a positive five ohms I2. Again, I get a different current here because there's a junction. I know that these two currents aren't necessarily equal. So I choose a new one, it's an unknown. So I get a positive number here. Again, if I'm wrong for I2, this will just inevitably give me a negative sign when I solve for it. Then I pass through, go through this battery. Well, I'm going the opposite direction as the battery. So now instead of it adding voltage, it's gonna be taking away. It's going to be taking away 10 volts. So I've gone through my full journey. I've gone back to my original point. I've taken count all the things I passed through. They have to add to zero. That's Kirchhoff's loop law. And so I can do that for the second one. So I chose this second loop here. Uh, let's say I start here. So I go through this battery. I'm going the same direction as battery. It's gonna be adding 10 volts. So I go through this resistor. I'm going the same direction as the current. So this is gonna be acting normally. Resistors take away voltage, negative sign. Then I go through this resistor, again, going the same direction as current. So I'm gonna be subtracting. Again, I have an I2 here and I have an I3 here. There's two different currents. 
And so then I get back to my original point and that's it for that loop. So I have all these terms, I have all these terms, uh, and then we'll be able to combine them and use them together and eventually solve for all these currents. So next step I did is I reduced these down a little bit. So you notice I have 20 volts minus 10. So I just re reduced that and wrote them in this way, a little bit simplified. So you may be thinking, uh, so we have two equations, but we have three unknowns. So the unknowns are I1, I2, and then I3. So I only have two equations. I can't actually solve for everything yet. So I actually need another equation. So the third equation is the junction rule. So I pick a junction, say I choose this junction. I know that I1 plus I2 coming together has to equal I3. So this is gonna be my third equation. So now I have enough equations, three equations with these three unknowns, I can linearly solve for them. And so you can do this in a whole number of ways. You can do this adding, subtracting, substitution. So I'll just, I'll just go over what I did for this one. So equation one and equation two. So the first thing I do is get rid of that pesky I3 that was in equation two. I use this substitution, write this in for I3. And then I have two equations with just two unknowns, all of them just I1 and I2. And I chose to multiply this first equation by five and then add it to the second equation. You can see what that does. So you can see that's gonna get rid of the I2. This times five plus negative 25 is gonna be zero. I'm only gonna be left with the I1s and that's exactly what happens here. So I go and distribute this five in here. We know that's gonna take out this other term. So then it's just collecting all the remaining ones. So I get 60 volts minus 170 ohms I1. And I find if I solve for that, I1 has to be six over 17 amps. So we're just doing linear algebra. Hopefully we learned a bit of that in pre-calc or maybe somewhere else, but we're just doing a math problem now. We've converted and taken this physics problem. It's purely just a linear algebra math problem. And once we get I1, a lot of it's gonna be easy now. So we can use any equation we want, really good to get back as long as it's just I1 and I2. So if we go and use equation two, um, we'll notice that if we know I1, we can just solve for I2 because we know everything else. And that's what we do. We solve for I2 here, put all the other stuff to the other side and we get I2 is two over 17 amps. And then we can get I3, you know, simply with the junction rule, just add these two numbers together and we get the junction rule gives us I3 is eight over 17 amps. That's all the currents. So we get all three of these currents and notice that we didn't get a negative sign here. I actually chose the right direction for all of them. But so if you get a negative sign for any of these three, that's fine. It just meant you chose the wrong direction. So just flip the direction and ultimately in the picture, or the answer, whatever asks you, it's perfectly okay, doesn't matter. Okay, that's everything I have today. Thank you for joining me as always. If you have any questions, any thoughts, let me know. Okay, well, good luck. Thanks, bye.